Um, I will say this. There's been a lot going on in the software world. So the biggest news items, and I'll, I'm going to go pull this up now. So um, I'm just deleting stuff here. The biggest new, news items are going to be the the software bubble actually kind of popping, the dot-com, the startup bubble. And I talk, I've been talking about that all week, uh, but that continues to show up. Uh, the growth of Go and Rust, uh, with Rust um, being taken on a little bit more, this is showing up a lot this week. Um, there's been a lot of buzz about Go in the news groups, and you can see them here in my new different alerts. So we're going to go through that. So if you don't have a time to see the whole coffee talk, the, it looks like the focus of what we discuss will be where the industry is going with regard to software development versus operations and cybersecurity, which seems to be a regular thing we talk about, as well as um, what's going on with Go and why you really want to start learning Rust like today. <laughs> And if you don't already know Linux, of course, which is always the subject of Coffee Talk. So uh, I'm going to start, first of all, with um, I'm just going to kind of go over the buzz in the Go world. And uh, then we'll hit, we'll, hit some, we'll hit some tweets with the time we have left. Again, we go until... When do we go until? We go until 12... Let's see. We go until... Was that right? Coffee Talk 11.30 to 1. And so that'll be the topic for right now. Um, until one, I didn't realize I went that one. We probably will finish before then, but I uh, just wanted to check that. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm off on my time a little bit. What time is it? 1.40. Yep. Uh, hey, Doris. Oh, she's not here. <laughs> We've already decided that this is going to be casual. And again, if you miss this, it's uh, going to go up on YouTube right away. So let's just, let's just read all of the 12 o'clock. I'm not going to be going just so you know. Um, so a bunch of random news here. I'm going to delete that. We'll get back to it, but I want to go over the go, the buzz in the go world. So this thread has been going on for a very long time. And if you don't know the people, if you don't recognize the names of the people on this thread, you should probably take note of them. So this is another reason you might, if, if you're interested in Go, that you want to get on the Go Nuts list. Um, and so just to give you a sense of this, um, so here we, here we go. Thanks for your follow-up, Eric. Um, Eric Raymond. Yes, that's the same ESR that wrote The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Uh, if you don't know what the Cathedral and the Bazaar is, you might want to Google it. If you are interested in Linux and open source of any kind, he's you know a pretty significant player uh, in the '90s at getting the open source movement going. You know, usually he's one of the ones who's mentioned in you know in the same I suppose paragraph as you know Stallman and Linus Torvalds, and these are these are people who are very fundamental to getting everything going. In fact, there are several people on here that you would recognize as pretty significant technologists in general, let alone uh, prominent people in the Go community. So, uh, and this thread continues to keep going. And so what this thread is about, Python to Go experience report on a large Python to Go translation. And the reason I'm bringing it up, and here, so we'll start with why you care. People are replacing Python everywhere with Go. And I'm not exaggerating that fact. Um, so I've told this story before, but the same week that, uh, Guido Van Rossum, the creator of Python, uh, re announced his retirement from, uh, the company, um, Dropbox was the same exact week that Dropbox, uh, put out a tweet saying that they had just completed, uh, porting some 32,000 lines of Python to go. And they're not the only ones. And if you don't understand what's going on you might want to go to go.dev which is a new site that did not exist uh, before the beginning of this year this is a 2020 site um, this has got case study after case study after case study about why go is the new general purpose language and that is the takeaway this is why you should care and i don't make statements lightly i just you just have to know that about me i research things and I watch the trends and I re subscribe to everything and you can see that on my coffee talk every day but this is where this conclusion comes from the conclusion is that if you are not learning go you are going to be left behind and 
and depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, but Go is very clearly taking over for Python as the general purpose language of choice. Let me say that again. So Go is taking over as the general purpose language of choice. No, it's not Node. No, it's not Python. No, it's not Rust. Rust is not a general purpose language. It's a good language. It's not. Python's a good language too. They're, they're all relatively good language. Java is going to be there because it's just legacy at this point. It's in everything. It's the modern COBOL. That's what I call it. So learn Go. And if you're not learning Go, you should start. And unfortunately, there aren't a lot of good documents out there. there there's a book that I recommend, um, Head First Go, but it's very dated. It doesn't cover Go 1.13. So we're going to continue to talk about Go uh, 1.13 and 1.14 today because 1.14 was released uh, two days ago. I spoke about this on previous Coffee Talks. And uh, to just give you a succinct summary of what's going on with the Go releases, um, Go 1.13 was a monumentally big release because of all of its uh, module support. So it has uh, a different way of handling how it deals with dependencies. Uh, it also uh, was the first time Go the Go um, module caching servers are a thing. And that's spectacularly cool because that means that you can now load uh, modules whether or not the GitHub or GitLab or any of Git resources are available because they have been cached in the in the the um, the Go caching servers, which are maintained by the Go people, and I believe are supported by Google as well. Uh, and nobody need to fret about Google's control over the language. This is not a thing. This is, you know, a BSD um, license. It's very open, and nobody ever needs to worry about that particular thing, as as they might have to with Java right now in March 20th, which is. This isn't news yet, but in, in, in was it March 20th, the Supreme Court will be hearing uh, the court case of Google versus Oracle over the Java API. So the Java language itself is 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 not only legacy and, and ugly, but it is also uh, a, the subject of a very, very important legal battle that's going to the Supreme Court in March. And for that reason, Greenfield Projects should run screaming from Java <laughs> Because Oracle has already won a case that says that they have prevented anyone else from using the API. I'm not talking about the code or writing their own engine. We're talking about the API. That means you can't even implement your own version of the language. All right. That is not open source. It's the worst. It's the, yeah. Well, here's a, here's a comment. What could be the outcome of the legal battle? Worst case, best case. The worst case scenario is if if Google loses on appeal, this is what this is, then for, it's not just for Java. The entire industry will now be governed by three forms of license: the 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 pre, you know the open source licenses or the free software licenses (GPL, MS, you know, the permissive and non-permissive). So that would mean uh, the MIT license, the BSD license, the you know, the GPL version two and version three, which are very significantly different from one another, as well as uh, the copyright licenses, which are the Creative Commons licenses that govern, um, you know, copyrighted material, traditional copyrighted material, stuff that normally was, you know, audio, video, written, all of that stuff. So that can all be released under Creative Commons. So those are the two current families of licenses. And what this court case could potentially create is another brand of licenses that govern and then there's you know patents is another thing but it 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 potentially could mean that we now have to have a different form of license for the API the API meaning that you might be able to copy the copyright licenses protect you from copying the documentation for example about Java you could say this is copyright you can't do that trademarks allow prevent that another thing but but what the court case is about is it's like we don't care how publicly this 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 language its keywords its syntax have been have been covered they won a court case against google saying you cannot use our api you cannot use our keywords you cannot use the java syntax in other words languages and their apis which is where they fall into this would now be subject to license and that has never been the case in previous yeah JavaScript would have to rename two string to something else. Not just that. I mean, but now what we're going to see is we're going to see potentially proprietary languages going after other languages then claiming that their APIs and keywords and format and use of curly brackets are all their property. So it's a very, very chilling decision. Uh, people that are following this have been, 
you know, talking about a lot. I haven't been following it as closely since the first court case, but in March, it's all going to hit the fan. Not only that, but other things are going to come before the Supreme Court regarding Google and Facebook and, and, and other people. So March is going to be a very interesting month for the legal, you know, evolution of what's going on in Silicon Valley and all these big companies and these big, the Oracle and Java had no love for each other. Meanwhile, quietly in the background, I reported on this yesterday. Yeah, quiet, yesterday I reported this, but quietly in the background, Oracle, um, sorry, Google is is really working diligently on Fuchsia. Uh, they actually came out and said that Go would not be a supported language on the Fuchsia operating system. This is a entirely built from scratch operating system released under the MIT license, not under GPL v2 or 3, which means that Google is positioning themselves to drop all GPL software, just as Apple has already demonstrated that they're doing. And you can read lots of material online about this. So now Apple is leaving the GPL. They're going with MIT and BSD licenses because they can steal, steal, steal and not give anything back. And they're doing the same thing now in, with, with Google. It's literally clear that they're seeking that same thing. And um, uh, wait, wait, was that the two string? I don't understand. Um, so anyway, that's something to take away from this. Um, so originally we were talking about Go and then we talked about the licensing. So let me return um python is being replaced by go everywhere every 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 major enterprise small and medium size big size they are all replacing python with go the python will still be a very valid language but it's it's going to be a niche language and a legacy language there's still lots and lots of web servers running on flask and pylons and all that but python is going away as a language as a primary language. It will become the world's greatest scientific calculator and it will be still used by scientists and TensorFlow people for now. I believe strongly that Go is going to eventually replace that. I just saw a thing about TensorFlow and Go. Um, so so that that's all changing. Um, JavaScript is not going to change. It's still, you have to learn that language first. It's still significant. But the, the, the multi-purpose languages uh, that are primarily based on the back end, those languages, you know, they're kind of vying for position right now. And Go and Rust are clearly the winners there. There's just no debate. That's not just a, that's not just a trending topic. That this is what we're seeing the industry do and what we're seeing, you know, new Greenfield projects pick up. So, so Scala, I, I think Scala is not particularly Greenfield. I, I think Scala falls into the category of we have a JVM and we need to make it work. Okay, so um, I I don't think that people are going to be reaching for Scala unless they already have a a Java a Java base, and that is a lot of the enterprise. So, but even you know even other enterprises of that size are throwing Java out entirely, including Scala, and they're going with they're going with Go and they're they're going with with Rust for C plus plus replacements. And again, this is the enterprise is somewhat different than. In my, in my estimation, the enterprise is usually about four years behind, two to four years behind what's coming out in the industry. And they are, you can tell that. So like, for example, um, I remember while I was uh, at, at IBM, we had some interns come in and they got, they got in, they got to work on Ruby on Rails and Ruby. And I had been, I wrote the INI module for God's sake, uh, for Ruby in like 2007, you know, and they were able to you know, come in and work with it in like 2010, 2012, because, uh, you know, IBM had kind of lumbered along and said, oh, hey, this Ruby thing's kind of cool. And uh, when I was at IBM, I mean, when I was at Nike before that, I remember asking, I told the story before on the stream, but I asked the guy, the, the senior, I was this, the Nike's webmaster for the internet. And I asked him, I said, can we please bring Apache in and replace this Netscape server? I want to use this Apache server. This is the 90s, right? So that was new. And um, it, w it took a year, a year or more, and the same team came to me and said, would you mind if we swap out and put Apache instead of your Netscape? And they were kind of asking me, <laughs> they were kind of saying, hey, can we do this? You know? And I was like, yeah, that, that's a great idea. You're really, really smart. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and um, so, so what I'm trying to say is that the, the trends that I'm seeing, the mega trends, then these aren't just, you know, these are these are mega trends that are that are that are picking up steam in the middle to small size business and in the popular community. Another one, by the way, is Arch. Um, so Arch is I keep seeing it references to this everywhere. Um, 
Arch is, hasn't jumped the wall yet into the Enterprise, but as far as we know, but the nature of the Enterprise may change, uh, which would mean, you know, more work from home kind of situations where you can use whatever operating system you want. So these are these are some pretty significant technologies that are emerging that everybody should be watching really carefully. Um, but in, in particular, in the case of Go and Rust, I believe you should like learn it today. Um, unless you want to work in Scala or Java or script or you, if, if you're going to pick up Python, you know, you should probably make sure you're into machine learning and data science and that kind of thing. If you're going to be doing statistics and astronomy, you should learn R. I mean, the languages that go with, I'm, I'm talking about a general purpose language. Go was created as a general purpose language to replace Python and Java and C++ at Google. That was its specific purpose. That was a specific raison d'etre. That was the reason it was created. So it's it's really, really good at it. And it's also relatively fat because it does things that more slimline languages like Rust do for us or C++ or, or C uh, that are generally used by more uh, advanced uh, programmers and developers. So um, my my takeaway there is, and we'll, we'll read some evidence of this further through these emails, but my takeaway is learn, learn Go. Of course, learn Linux. Linux is a given. Um, and then learn uh, Rust in there somewhere. Of course, web tech is also a given. So web tech is a given and Linux is a given. And then the, the extra, the next steps are, are, I believe, Go and Rust. And so I've been putting a great deal of effort in there. And C is still very valid as well. Uh, if you want more information specifically on this, you can watch um, the Brian Kentrill video, Should We Replace the Operating System with Rust, where he concludes, no, we shouldn't, but pretty much everything else. And, and that there's a big database firm uh, in FlexDB, which is very clearly moving to Rust um, for their next iteration. They are a time-based database that we actually have to know some of the people locally here, and or one of them anyway. And... Um, and they, they are very well positioned for the IoT market and they have decided apparently to move into Rust. We can tell that because their Flux, which is their, they have a specific um, SQL query language called Flux and their Flux tool has um, a Rust parser. So a parser that's written in Rust. So the, the writing seems to be on the wall that they're also migrating. So anytime I run across some new piece of really awesome system software, Alacrity, uh, and then now in FlexDB and things like this, I keep hearing about them being written in Rust. So, uh, this was kind of hard for me to come around, but I'm, that's the next thing I'll be learning on stream. Uh, I've coded only very trivial Rust on stream, uh, so I will be learning Rust along with all y'all on stream. They have very good documentation. I'll be going through that, and um, uh, I'll be doing a lot of that to, uh, to, just, get, to just get through it. So, uh, so I'm reading the chat here. Uh, most of my work is in the browser. Yep, currently Svelte is my favorite browser programming language. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to look at Svelte. Svelte is, you're talking about framework, right? Yeah. Svelte, Svelte is really, really, really interesting. Um, I haven't played with Svelte yet, Jess. I'd love to hear about that. Um, uh, my, my current favorite is Vue. Uh, but when I talk about web knowledge, I'm talking about primarily just about the DOM, not necessarily picking a framework for most people. But then those who want to get into application development, yeah, Svelte, Vue, Angular, you know, even Ember. Um react i hate react but okay um i just it just so happens i learned to go today slices were nice methods interface is kind of meh well you'll 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 like them eventually <laughs> yeah i i, I come you can, the, the first time you play around with go you're like this language is backwards because it puts everything you put all of their type definitions and in, and in, in, um declarations declaration information comes after so yeah it's pretty fun rust is rust is the other way so Svelte is a compiler, technically its own programming language, super set of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Oh, really? Hmm. That I did not know. I really need to look at Svelte. Jess, thanks for bringing that to us. Um, I have Svelte. I'm glad you mentioned that because Svelte has been coming on my radar a lot lately. Um, and, you know, it's it's been kind of bubbling up like it's going to be something. Um, if, it, if it's reactive and it combines HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, that should be really interesting to see. Um, hopefully we won't get another, you know, ill-conceived tool for creating you know document pages for the world wide web that have widgets in them that are completely unrenderable which we'll cover today all right so it's 12 o'clock uh that leaves us with about an hour to go um receiver argument is just naughty business 
<laughs> yeah, I think so too. Uh, I'm working on making a svelte course right now. Fantastic. Well, I am all about plugging that. So I'm going to click on that. Oh, can you guys see my link? I'm going to click on that. Um, I, I, I have a feeling I'm really going to like svelte because I have, I, the, the, I, it feels like, I don't know, but it feels, it feels like that svelte is coming out of this kind of, you know, reaction to these fat bloated built, you know, have to have a full babble and, and everything else kind of, you have to really, really have a full build environment for, for web applications. And I, I hope that's what it is. I hope, I, I hope it turns out to be, um, I hope it turns out to be, and that's why I like Vue because Vue is progressive. So you can have a document page and use Vue without a problem. You can do it with React too, but with Vue it just seems more natural. And so you can just kind of add it on. If you have a reactive component you want to add to your document, which I have a lot of because I'm a teacher. So I'm a lot of times I'll write documentation about a lesson and I want to have an interactive component of that lesson. And I got to tell you, Vue is just so ideally suited to, you know, carve out a div on the, on the, on the machine, on the page and place your, place your interactive content in there. And then of course your content is not dependent on the interactive component that's been, you know, composed into your web page. So for me, Vue, and you find, I find this a lot, I find a lot of educators really, really love Vue for that reason, because what they're doing is they're making like a little quiz app or they're making, you know, and they can include the same Vue library uh, in all of their pages and even, you know, consolidate all of their code into um, and then use data attributes. They can use data attributes to pass data into Vue, so so they can actually you know create these little segments of of interactive like test yourself sort of content without you know having to use just the DOM and also having a, some of the some of the components from Vue. Uh, I believe all of that's possible with React, but my but that's I I, I keep I continue to run into to educators who create their own content who just really really like Vue for that reason. Uh, Vue is Vue many would would agree is is easier to pick up uh, because of its you know minimal nature you don't need to have a full-blown build environment which is normally recommended with react and so if svelte which of course is what the word means right if svelte proves to follow through on a lot of that direction that view is going in i'm very 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 interested uh minus the compiler dimension similar to, yeah so um does this svelte have a com well i guess svelte has to have a compiler Right, because it's putting HTML and everything together. Do you know? If, do you know if Svelte com complies with the? Um, does Svelte com comply with the? Uh, some of the some of the direction in the web components space. Do you know about that? Like the Polymer stuff. I'm always trying to to measure everything against Polymer, which I haven't used, but just to see if it's you know where it where it fits into the to the whole mix. Yeah, if you have anything to tell us about that, I really appreciate it. I'm I'm looking forward to your site. I'll I'll go out there and check it out. Yeah, please make sure to keep in touch. Maybe give me a follow. I I would love to to um highlight your site when you get it when you get it published and make a video about it because because I I really believe I mean you know you probably know this term but framework fatigue framework fatigue is a term that's kind of a joke in the web industry because frameworks come out so fast that you know. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. But I haven't finished my other project. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. It's like exhausting. It's like so exhausting not to <laughs> not to keep up. You know, you're like, you're like, I can't keep up with all of these cool things that are coming out. And for the record, by the way, um, the same that same uh, sort of thing happens with go terminal ui application frameworks so you had like last week or two weeks ago we had tview and before that we had uh we had turnbox and now we have then we had tv t cell and then tview and now we have c view because the tview guy doesn't want to maintain it anymore and so it's, not, it's like there's always a new terminal ui framework in go coming out so it's going to be fun to watch I'm, I'm really excited to see this all right let's go back to uh some of the news of the day so I mentioned three main things, uh, the, the go thing, why you need to learn it. Um, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm not going to bag on node, uh, other than to say that everybody is replacing node as a backend. The creator of node hates it. 
He doesn't even support it anymore. And the creator, the creator of Express has long since abandoned Node for Go, like since in 2008, I think. So maybe 10. And so that kind of, you just, Node, Node was an accident that, that got really, really popular. And if you are, other than doing stuff um, on, on the back end that involves JavaScript already or for legacy, you shouldn't be reaching for Node. And the number one reason you shouldn't is because it's not concurrent. It's it well. That's to be fair. It's concurrent, and it, they're doing a thing with web workers where they're trying to make it so that they basically have threads. They're, they're trying to rebuild threads in some really weird Frankenstein way because the language wasn't built to do that. The language was not was built to deal with concurrency through the event model, and so now they're trying to add on the equivalent of basically, you know, green threads or what they're called coroutines sometimes, where they split up an individual thread of execution and share it, uh, and then you know, like Rust, Rust has threading. Uh, you have green green threads in Go. So the number one reason that Go is getting picked up as a multipurpose language is because the multipurpose world is concurrent. It's highly concurrent. So now we're starting to get 32, you know, 32 core systems, uh, Threadripper and stuff like that. And so those systems, in order to take full advantage of those processors, you have to write code concurrently. And by the way, if you're not learning how to write your code to run on multiple processors at the same time, you need to start learning that. If, you, if, if it's one thing I could just scream, Learn today how to make your hello world program concurrent. Make it make it say hello on one one go, go routine or co routine, and make it say world on another one. Because the entire world is going to be concurrent. All the code must be concurrent. And so the languages that really shine in the concurrency space are really going to dominate, uh, particularly in. Um, particularly in the multi-purpose world, and that is Go's sweet spot. Go's concurrency is imperative. It doesn't have these horrible uh, async await promises and all that stuff to deal with that nobody really likes, but nobody wants to say so. In fact, it, it almost feels you almost feel dirty using Go because it's so easy to use its concurrency model uh, imperatively. You know, you don't have to be afraid of sleep statements. You can because they just sleep the single thread. It's very, very much. It's very. It's a lot more intuitive. I'll just put it that way. Uh, Rust does have concurrency. I haven't played with it yet, but my understanding is Rust concurrency is still thread-based, which means that it gives you more. You have to control it more, so that means you get a single thread. You know, you have to deal with threaded programming like you would have to do with C++, which makes sense because Go kind of Go is kind of doing some of these things for you because it's a multi-purpose language to replace Python, and Rust is kind of getting out of your way and making sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot with memory leaks and stuff, but less, still letting you do the hard stuff like the, because it really wants to give you control, such as garbage collection and you know concurrency, that kind of thing. So it kind of gets out of your way, more like C++ gets out of your way, sort of, you know, C and C++. So Rust and Go are really two complementary languages that people should be learning um, that want to do with systems programming and, and applications on the back end, and who knows what WebAssembly is going to do to that whole thing on the front end as well all right so um, I'm gonna go back and read some some things here yeah you can enable custom element support but it's oops but it's off by default because it adds more bloat okay yep thanks for the fall oh I didn't notice sorry okay so a survey my who's a react programmer my coping with framework fatigue is that I don't care any longer <laughs> I just came to peace with the idea that I can't prepare beforehand and will have to learn whatever is needed when needed. That is really good advice, the Cervic. It's really, really good advice. And that's coming from somebody who works in the web place, the web space quite a bit. So I, I, that's, I, I agree completely. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, we ship. So Jess says, yes, yeah, we the, the, the ship has sailed on programming language stability. Even C++ has a new st syntax every couple of years. That's true. And I, I'm just going to say it again for Go. Go Go 2, the talk about Go 2 is going on now. Um, and they have changed the syntax somewhat, but they've, they've maintained backward compatibility pretty well. They're not doing a Python 2.3 thing, which was a disaster. Um, and, you know, the fact that we had to give Python, you guys probably don't know this, the fact that, I mean, the, the Python 2 deadline for the from the Python Foundation was 2015 initially. And so many people complained because they didn't want to do it, that they had to push it out to 2020 and many people still missed it. So, and if you don't know what's going on there, Python 2 versus 3, the single biggest thing that it's missing is not the print statement. It's, it's the fact that it didn't have built-in Unicode support. So Go was built by one of the co-authors of the Unicode standard. 
It has the best Unicode support of any language I've ever encountered, and I've gone through a lot. Oh, sorry about that. I don't know if I'll have to... You know, you're off. I should probably just turn the sound off. Um, and, oh, please, I'm blocking the channel instead, instead of away. <laughs> what? Oh, it has blocking channels instead of a wait. Are you talking about Go? So does Python. <laughs> they do. What is it called? There's an acronym for it. Um, I like Gooseberries. That's a great name. Uh, that's my favorite uh, game, by the way. So, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it has blocking channels instead of a wait. Yeah, blocking channels are way, way, way better. They just are. They're easier to comprehend. Not everybody is as smart as you, Acerbic. Right? I tell, I'm t I've been around long enough to see to see coders, particularly junior and, and medium coders, like run screaming from threaded programming. It, it's... Okay, so one of the number one demands in the industry is going to be concurrent programming. Okay? So the, one of the greatest demands for solutions is going to require concurrent programming. And that means we want the language that has the least possible learning curve the least possible problem scenario for our language of choice for for concurrent programming otherwise and this is exactly why it was made it was actually made for novice programmers at google which is you know a different standard of course <laughs> so <laughs> um enough 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 talking about languages um I did want to conclude here, though, just to show you this list. There's been a lot of chatter on the list because 1.14 was released. And 1.14 has problems, man. It's got problems. It's, they're not really, you know, killer problems, but they're enough to stay on 1.13 until they get it worked out. So the first problem it had was it didn't, it, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't even work on certain versions of old Mac. It won't compile. Uh, and, the, and the other ones are that the, the performance was, um, was really low. So... Uh, they had taken a pretty good hit on performance. And so at the same time, this is like, you know, a week on a week after the whole Discord thing, which 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 really blew up the Go list in reaction to Discord's announcement that they replaced Go with Rust, but they replaced Go one point nine, which was an ancient one, with Rust for something that should never have been written in Go in the first place. And it was fun to watch the list kind of blow up on that. So uh concurrent primitives, um Unrelated, in the future, you'll find yourself converting more projects that need advanced regex. They talk about, um, there's just, there's a lot of good things going on in here. I just won't, but, so people are porting Python to, uh, go to Python. Python to go. There we go. And um, you should watch the list if you care. You can listen. I'm going to be summarizing the list if you'd rather hear my interpretation. But if you want to read it yourself, you're welcome to subscribe to Go Nuts. Uh, let's see. Regex is not sure if there's something equivalent. No. Modules and cross compilation. So a lot of people don't know Go's greatest value prop. One of its greatest value propositions is that I can write Go code on a Mac, compile it, and it won't run on that Mac. It has to be run on its target uh, um, definition. So that means it has to be run someplace else. Um, uh, do, do, do. Who calls instead of texting anymore? <laughs> uh, promises just make sense to me. You spawn them to be fulfilled sometime later and if you need execution threads to come together you collect your promises away down the bunch yeah it's not it's not horrible it's definitely better than what was out there before but it's just it's not the same as the reason that i i prefer and not just me a lot of other people prefer uh the the go routine and the blocking channels and the communication between the channels because the concurrency model is exactly the same as what's already in unix so if you're familiar with how Linux deals with processes and, and communication between them and the idea of pipes, um, that is exactly how they've implemented Go, or Go routines. So um, modules and cross compilation. So Go is getting kind of a black eye in 1.14 because it did not do a good job of documenting modules and it's really got a lot of beginners out of sorts because things just don't work as well with the module system. It's a very, very complicated thing to get into, so I won't go into it right now, other than to say that in the past, you could just have all your stuff in, in one directory and have, you know, get pull your stuff down, 
and just work on a whole bunch of things concurrently. And the problem that people are having now is if they're working on two packages concurrently, they have to commit the one before they can work on the other one because of cross dependencies, unless they know about the replace keyword. So if you happen to be a Go programmer and you're watching this right now, the number one thing you need to understand about Go modules besides you know what they're for and everything is the replace keyword. I promise you, particularly you like really crazy Go programmers who do a lot of packages at the same time, you're, you're going to love the replace keyword because the replace keyword allows you to define in your go.mod file uh, something that you can link to that's local and it will prevent it from going up and getting it from the repo, which may or may not have been updated. So that allows you to concurrently work on the two things. Now, when you finally deploy both of those items, you want, and this is the rub, people are, have got change requests and proposals in for this. It, when you finally want to deploy your final version, you have to remove those replace statements from your go.move so that they'll become dependent on the actual packages and not your copy of the package over here. So that's that was the one thing. It took me a full day and a half to figure that out. And I was like researching it everywhere. I couldn't find it anywhere. So I, I mentioned it because in the hopes that I can save uh, some other, you know, Go programmer that, that kind of pain, who particularly programmers who are working on multiple packages at the same time, or some of the packages may be private. Um, there's another way to get around private packages as well, but we can talk about it another another time. All right. So depending on your use of SQLite, there are a few pure, pure Go libraries for SQLite. Well, that's fine. Uh, Let's see here. I want to come back to the Lua information here. So this is, I think this is related to this. So uh, Mac OS is running on uh, 1.14 has been running a SIG illegal um, statement. And this is, this is another version of this bug, which has been opened as a release blocking bug uh, and, and has been categorized as a release blocking bug by the, by the Go team. So once again, if you are on a Mac in particular, if it's old, don't do 1.14. So they've kind of, they can't recall 1.14 now that they released it. It's unfortunate they released it when they did. Yeah, we're going to talk about Lua too. Lua is a great language um, for what it is. And uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Uh, Digital Ocean, I'm going to get back to that. So there's another, there's the other SIG, SIG, SIG bug. Uh, so they have some pretty bad error. I really feel like 1.14 was rushed out, to tell you the truth. I feel bad for the team because I feel like they they had three people come forward on the list and say, hey, look, I got benchmarks that are not coming in as well as they did, and they were significantly slower. And they did they released it anyway. And so, I mean, you know, like three days later, I saw official release. I was like, wait a second, you're not even going to look at these problems? So I don't know what caused that, but I get the sense that, and they lost their Java guy, I get the sense that the governance team over on the go Go side is is not what it once was. I th maybe because there's a volume of changes that are coming in and the growth speed. I don't know the reasons. It's not, but something's definitely different over there. Um, yeah, uh, used a little Lua before because of Arduino. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to delete this modules and cross compilation. Uh, hey, I have a bill from the from the car. Uh, I do want to get to these notifications at some point. Um, I think we've, there's the Golang alert, well, reasons we're talking about it. Nine reasons you should use the Go play programming language. Uh, I will I will post this in the chat, but not in the comments on YouTube, sorry. Um, this is a 404. Did they take it down? Why would they do that? That, that looks like a... That doesn't even look that good. I was going to check it out. Huh. Well, well, you are not getting my attention then. AWS Lambda context open objects in Go. Yep. Go is another reason. Go is one of these standard uh, languages that's supported by um, AWS and everybody else, along with Python and Node. Uh, Lambda function errors in Go. Okay. We will just skip that alert. All right, so let's move on to a new topic. Um, since we're talking languages, why don't we talk about Lua for a little bit? Um, let me just ca catch up on the comments. Um, Lua, 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 yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, Roblox, you might not know it, but I deal with a lot of young people, and Lua is the language. Of course, Lua is the language of modern heaven, too. 
You know Roblox? Yeah. <laughs> Roblox is all on Lua. But Roblox also hates Linux. If they catch you using Linux through Vulkan or something, they will ban you permanently. Oh, did you really? Yeah, well then you're probably a big Lua guy. You can probably teach me a lot about it. I know I know very little of it. And it seems to me that it's um, very data-centric. I'm sure I'm quite a big Roblox, yeah. Um, all you need is tables, 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 tables. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I can to quote you on that. So Sir Big, who's done a lot of Roblox streaming, says, Lua, data structures? OOP? Puny mortals. All you need is tables. Tables, 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 tables. <laughs> Aliases, tables. No, it's like... that. I'm, it's, I'm glad you said that, because my experience with Lua was, wait, is this just a map? It's in the you know, dictionary map. It's like, it seems like everything is a table. It's like everything... <laughs> And that's really all it is, right? And that it makes me understand how people can mod games so easily because they just have to write a bunch of tables. <laughs> so um, apparently there was some news about Lua, Lua and the open source highlights, which is unusual, I gotta say. Um, uh, open source highlights usually focuses on really, you know, free software foundation -y kind of things. And so to hear them uh, talking about Lua is pretty cool. So they have a, a link here. Lua is a minimalistic, lightweight language implemented as a C library, and this is why it's the number one most embedded language of all. Uh, this two-page cheat sheet includes some tips about syntax, uh, and you can go ahead and download the cheat sheet. So this is really cool. Um, I do think Lua is, Lua is one of those. You can learn it really quickly. Um, if you want to really have fun with Lua, though, do some Roblox coding. You have to have a Windows machine for that. Um, and uh, maybe make a mod for your favorite, your favorite, uh, you know, game. So my first experience with Lua was uh, World of Warcraft, actually. World of Warcraft modding, you know, or dealing with other people's mods, frankly. And, um, and so, but here's the funny thing. While I was at IBM, somebody implemented an extension into one of our core tools with Lua because Lua is a C library it can be it, it can be embedded into anything else so you, you find people adding on modularity to other to other applications using uh, Lua so it's a fun language to learn there's a good chance you're gonna need to program it at some point uh, it's not a core language by any means but it's definitely a fun language and um, it, you know you never know I mean there's a lot of a lot of game game engines use it to adapt their games it's, it's the language of mod of modding period um, Roblox hates cheaters because there's a bunch of griefers exploiters there and little kids can't handle it and Roblox thinks wine is some hacking tool absolutely <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that because when I found out that if you used wine you, you would be hacked you, I, I dropped Roblox entirely from the school I'm like I, we're not doing this anymore I don't, I don't want to support this company I was kind of sad because Roblox is otherwise a great way to approach education because kids love it and it's a great way to teach real coding Lua is real coding even if it might be not you know JavaScript, and then so we've we've gone to JavaScript for coding everything, including starting out by making our first phaser games and stuff like that, um, because it was a world of embedded language for for its add-ons. Yep, yeah, Acerbic, I said they've had exactly the same thing. I think without even reading this, um, yeah, World of Warcraft was the first time I encountered Lua. Period, and that was what God, twenty years ago. How how long ago was that? When did it, when did it come out? Hmm. There have been a few games in the last few, past few months that have been banned. Linux players for using wine and Letras to play the game. Yep. What games? Anti-cheat? you kidding me? Really? You need to tell me what games so I don't play them. <laughs> because I'm about to play Witcher. Witcher you wouldn't get banned for. It's not a multiplayer. I mean, Overwatch. We've we've successfully played Overwatch under Letras. And I wonder if that has a ban. That's actually a fun game to play on. Linux because it's pretty fast. I might even work on my own conversion here. That's something I might be willing to do on stream. It's like go through and try to learn how to do Letras and Vulkan and get and get Overwatch to run on a Linux machine because that I think that's a topic that might be, you know, maybe for the end of the day kind of thing. Just kind of hack on it and see if we can get it to work and talk about how to do it. I integrated, Jess says, I integrated the Lua runtime into a C++ program on an airplane with no Wi-Fi and just the Lua docs. <laughs> exactly. That's why it's so popular for, for, I don't think it's going anywhere. So 
I, I mean, I, I actually saw it pop up in enterprise software because it's so easy to, to configure. So Lua, as far as I'm concerned, Lua is not just for modding games and playing wrong, you know, making my Roblox worlds. Lua is an enterprise grade language that everybody should really learn um, at some point because your chances of encountering it are pretty high. Same with Python, right? You're going to encounter it. Battlefield 5, it looks like looks like the big one. Oh, man. Rocket League discontinued Linux Online support. They're one of the ones that's been dropping Linux support, right? That's that whole Epic thing. I, I am not a fan of Epic anymore. <laughs> like, how dare you? How dare you disparage the name of Linux by saying it's Canada? Sorry. Yeah. We have a commentary. Okay. Come on in. What do you got to say there, sir? For a coffee talk. Uh, I think coffee is a it's, substance it's, that relies on... Uh, is it gonna is it gonna help me avoid the coronavirus? No. My subject of is my great informer on the coronavirus uh, epidemic. Did you guys hear about the Iranian guy, by the way? Tell us the story about that. So there were the, here, here, come over here. You the gotta be closer to the health minister was like the health minister said what? It was like, you know, this is all under control. We got this. And went on talk shows. But it turns out he was infected the entire time. The Iranian health minister was infected the entire time he and, was going on talk shows. And infecting talking other about people, how it was okay. Coughing all over the place. Coughing all over the... <laughs> and now, just him alone probably infected 50 people oh based God. off how many people he's met. Oh, my God. That story is great. Otto's current, always current on current events. So it's great to hear from him i'm going to get him on stream here eventually uh he's a natural streamer he's quite the character um so well curb, curb your enthusiasm <laughs> so how did they find out they had he had the virus it's, i have no idea i've just i've just heard it from my news source here um yeah antibodies <laughs> what do you got here okay so lua is good because it, of how easy it is to sandbox yeah yep it's basically the docker of programming acerbic you are like so quotable i am glad i have you online that can do all these quotes uh redis supports lua for code that runs right in the redis server holy shit i mean not that really i didn't know that epic epic uh epic games linux eac that one i've heard about i'm pretty sure uh so far yeah oh wow 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 wow, wow. this is a great news thank you thank you guys community of news gatherers here um gaming on linux uh led to concerns about you linux user base it also to qualms about role play yeah i'm gonna read this this is getting read for metro exodus to rocket league epic aggressive acquisition of games has become a grave cause for concern uh and even eac for linux games became embroiled in the controversy epic brought anti-cheat a few months back See, I had a feeling that they were at the center of all of this. Um, ma, 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 ma. Gary's Mod, the actual story. Everybody on Reddit. When I asked for clarifications, Newman shed light on an earlier statement as he was a primary source of the entire story. Hey, thanks for the nudge and trying to inject some clarity. I didn't know Epic was anti-Linux and I've never had the impression from the EAC. All of this was the first time I've heard about it. See, I'm, from what I'm hearing, including from the guy whose mouth who tweeted it, or fingers that yeah they not as far as i remember i was mentioned in conversation by us and we had an increasing amount of cheats on linux and contemplated whether it was better off to just stop ship shipping the linux version our decision eac eac said that linux development was paused so uh it would be fine by them i didn't get the impression that i meant that all games they protect but i can see how that de that their development time would go into stopping the majority of cheats Newman has also Newman also added that there were issues for the studio as it relates to Rust's Linux version. That's a game, not the language, since it was not financially viable. So, it's funny because it's kind of the anti. I mean, when Gabe Newell came out and said that every game that he this game the Valve was going to make was going to, which isn't very many, was going to be just you know Linux, uh, Windows, and Mac. It was going to be supported on all three. I just find that really fascinating that that they would do that. Um. Yeah, 
I tell you what, this anti-cheat stuff is going to be very interesting because Linux people are born to cheat, not to cheat, but to hack. And they'll figure out some way to get around it. So, yeah, let's see. Is there any evidence for cheating in Linux? Uh, Gabe is the saint of gaming. <laughs> the, the percent of Linux users is already small already. Uh, what percent of small, small A are cheating? Sounds like a minuscule number. I guess so too, but it's the whole we're afraid of Linux thing. It's like that guy we were watching the other day. You know, he, that's probably why he chimed in on the whole Linux thing in general, because Linux isn't even in the mouths and minds of mainstream people until something like this goes down. And then all of a sudden they have an opinion on it. <laughs> you know, it's like, my opinion is Linux sucks, just use Windows. But I've never, ever, even once used it. So. 200% of Linux users are cheating. Everybody knows Linux equals dirty hackers. <laughs> exactly. That's my point. <laughs> or it's a foreign word. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a fun topic all by itself. Linux on the desktop is really rocking stuff up. I love how Linux is rocking the world up. You know, Google and Apple are running screaming from GPL3. We don't want Linux. Nothing to do with Linux. Nothing to do with GPL at all. Bye-bye, GNU. <laughs> you know, they're all running away from it because they don't think they can make money on it. Meanwhile, Lin the Linux community is figuring out how to play every game that exists in the world on Linux <laughs> from other coders who have added it to it. And the, and the gaming world is like, what are we going to do with this? All these hackers, all these smart people, we're afraid. We're so afraid. <laughs> what, what will become of our games and our market share and our money? And the Linux is like, we're coming for you. <laughs> we're coming for you. <laughs> we're coming for you. You know what? We're not even going to break any laws. <laughs> we're just going to, we're just going to emulate, 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 emulate. <laughs> this is great because because the whole open free software mentality is like seriously like attacking <laughs> these people. <laughs> they're like, because they're not, because their whole way of life is going to go away because, because at least they think it is, because they're going to go down. You know what's going to happen? The thing that's going to kill these big companies, not Microsoft. Microsoft's not stupid. You know what? This, this is the, okay. So we were talking about that guy the other day who was like railing on Linux, right? But if he took, five minutes to research the new Linux department, you know, several dozen people working at Microsoft on Linux every day who only run Linux and their whole job is promoting Linux on Windows. If he, if they had done that, if they had even done that, then it would be, you know, this, this conversation would be over. He wouldn't have even been able to really come up with the conclusions that he's had because he was, <laughs> So, but but they don't they don't have any idea so you can't you can't really get angry at them until they start attacking you um, but most of the time it's just you know it's the mob with pitchforks we don't understand this and so we're gonna throw it out we're gonna burn you hey thanks for the fall it's Adrian uh, so <laughs> oh where were we how much time I got I gotta stick with my timeline oh I think I'm running out of time people uh, where's my calendar Calendar, calendar, calendar. Probably a good time to review the calendar for those who just joined. Um, I'm trying to follow a schedule these days. Oh well, I look, I look sillier than usual. <laughs> I gotta fix the beard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotta, you know, you gotta have. Here's the thing: you have to have a, a, a beard because, you, like, when you're thinking, you gotta have something to do with your. <laughs> anyway, so the schedule. Where are we on the schedule? We are at 12:30. Up. Oh, we're back into. Editing video time. We're four minutes over, but it's been fun. And uh, I just wanted to say I will be back um, to be doing. Uh, we 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 talked about the software stuff yesterday, so I'm not stressed about that. Um, accessorize like a boss. Pick your mic stuff in tone with your beard. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It's funny too. I didn't even plan that. I've actually had this dead cat for a while. That's a, their official name. It's not Tribble. So many people don't know what a tribble is. Tribble. Trouble with tribbles. Someone called it that. So I'm going to call it. I'm going to get done here and move on. Um, next, I'll be on next uh, just in chat for sessions. And then tonight, as usual, be on for craziness. Uh, if you actually want to watch me code, 
uh, I will be coding during chat on, on small things, but on the serious things, I'll be coding um, tomorrow morning at, what is the time? I have to look at it again. I need to print this out and put it like right here. <laughs> so let's see. Yep, eight, well, 8 a.m. for yoga. So 9 a.m. Uh, two hours every day I'm doing live coding. Tomorrow's coding will be uh, more uh, GitLab GraphQL in bash using curl so that that's coming up and uh i probably will do a little bit of that uh, tonight as well uh thanks as usual for checking in and providing all this great information you guys are definitely the difference between a fun group and a boring group and uh uh let's just say uh, last comment if you don't know what a triple is you got some shows to watch exactly uh it's been great, and you can look for this video in the next hour or so. Take care.